Good morning, my name is Reverend David Clark and I welcome you to Morgan Baptist Church Online. Psalm 80 says, Clear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord Almighty, will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink bowls of tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Let us sing together Christ our hope in life and death.
Bible reading is from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of him? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honour. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swims the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Sing again when I survey the wondrous cross. this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let's sing again meekness and majesty.
reading is from Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 to 18. It is not to angels that he subjected the world to, to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified. What is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with glory and honour and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honour because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, he says. I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God and that he might make atonement for the sins of his people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you today. I ask that you would feed us from your holy words. Help me, Lord, as I preach your word to your people. Two weeks ago, in Hebrews chapter 1, we looked at Jesus, the superior saviour, <coughs> and focused on his deity. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. And remember, we also looked at Jesus' superior message, that we need to pay more careful attention to it. Therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Today we shift focus to the humanity of Christ and we look at the incarnation, God taking human flesh, Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. And we're looking at the question, why did Jesus become human like one of us? The writer quotes Psalm 8 verses 4 to 6 which is a meditation on the place of humankind in God's creative scheme. Verse 6 is an example of Hebrew parallelism, the second line repeating the meaning of the first. What is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? And here the son of man is just another way of saying man. A mankind is destined to rule over creation, a destiny and a dignity that we've largely missed in our sinful humanity. The writer says, yet at present we do not see everything subject to him, that is mankind. However, many of you will know that the Son of Man is also a messianic title, which in places Jesus attributes to himself. So in the next verses, the writer elegantly casts Jesus is the true Son of Man, made a little lower than the angels. That is, taking on our humanity. And he says, but we see Jesus now crowned with glory and honour. Jesus, the man we were intended to be like, is now risen, ascended and glorified. But the pathway to glory and honour for Jesus was death. He suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So the first reason then that Jesus took our humanity upon himself was so that he could die. 
2,000 years on, we don't grasp the offence that this statement would have caused some of the writer's original audience. St Paul writes, But we preach Christ crucified, an obstacle to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The idea that God could die a sinner's death was especially offensive to Jews. Paul calls it a scandal, a stumbling block or an offence. Perhaps some of the scandal, the offence caused, comes across in this poem. They spit on his face and then they crucify him. Jesus our Lord, he dies as a sinner, he dies as a blasphemer, as an idolater, as one who denies God, as one who betrays him. I stand before the cross and wonder, he is not guilty of those things but takes our place. He dies as one who boasts, who gossips, as one who dishonours his parents, as a cheat, as a liar, as a thief. He dies as a fraud and an embezzler. I stand before the cross in fear. He is not guilty of these things, but takes our place. He dies as a sinner. He dies as one with evil thoughts, as a slave to lust, as a fornicator, as an adulterer, as an abuser of children. I kneel before the cross and weep. He is not guilty of these things, but takes our place. He dies as one full of jealousy, as one who is selfish, unkind and rude, as one who destructively manipulates others, as one who envies and hates. He dies as a sadist, as one who destroys and murders. I pray before the cross and rejoice. He is not guilty of these things, but takes our place. He is not to blame, but takes the blame for us. He is dying to forgive us. Stand, stand, and watch Jesus die, alone with nothing, God on a stick. The writer then moves on to say, in bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God for whom and through whom everything exists should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. The New International Version calls Jesus the author of salvation. The Greek there, word there is archegos, which means something like originator, the head of a clan, also a leader in the sense of being a pioneer. When I was in the Scouts, we used to do something called pioneering, which... Uh, basically meant lashing bits of wood together to make bridges that you could use for crossing, say, a stream. They used to have something in, in Britain called the Pioneer Corps, the Royal Pioneer Corps, and their job was to build the roads for the army to clear the way through the jungles, to make a way for the troops. And in the old Western films, you had the pioneers, didn't you, the ones who blazed a trail across the Wild West. The translation author is fine if your hero is Jane Austen, but not if your hero is John Wayne or Scott of the Antarctic or Edmund Hillary. You see, Jesus is our pioneer. He is the one who goes ahead of the column, the one who blazes the trail for glory. And the writer explains the reason that Jesus is qualified for such a role. He says it's fitting for God that he, that he should make Jesus our pioneer of salvation through suffering. It was God's wisdom that Jesus should suffer, even though it seems foolish to human philosophers. Jesus always was perfect in his sinlessness. But also he was perfected through obedience and submission to the Father's will. He was perfected in his identification with suffering humanity. Leon Morris describes this as the difference between the perfection of a rosebud and the perfection of a rose. Jesus didn't just come to share our humanity, he came to change it. 
Now for the second reason that the rise that the gives for Jesus coming was to bring us to glory. And the reason we can't achieve glory by ourselves and without Jesus is because of our sinful state. Jesus has come in the flesh to make men holy. As we follow Jesus, our pioneer, we have been made fit for glory that is sanctified by sharing his family likeness. The writer says, both the same, the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. We are brothers together with Christ. And the picture here is of Jesus marching at the head of the army of faith into the presence of God and the saints, unashamed to shout, here I am and here are my beloved brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. The third reason the writer gives for Jesus coming in the flesh is to destroy the power of death. Another meaning of archikos is that of champion. The Greeks in their mythology had champions like Ajax who fought the Trojan champion Hector on behalf of the entire army. In these battle of the champions it was the winner taking all. One man wins the victory for the entire army. The Jews had their own champion of course in David. David took on the Philistine champion Goliath and defeated him. And so Jesus is the Archegos, the champion of our salvation. Jesus shared our flesh and blood so that by his death he might destroy those who hold the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And the root cause of death is sin, and the wages of sin is death. And the writer goes on to explain how Jesus' incarnation and death dealt with our sin problem. He says in verse 17, for this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Jesus is both the purified priest, a theme expanded later in Hebrews, and also the victim. Jesus takes upon himself in the cross, in human flesh, the penalty of our sin. And by our, his death removes our guilt, rendering impotent, that's what destroy really means in verse 14, the power of the devil. And this victory liberates us from the slavery of the fear of death, a victory demonstrated at the resurrection, a victory to be consummated at the return of Jesus, when after a while, the devil and death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire. You can read about that in Revelation 20. We no, need no longer fear the grave. Hallelujah. There's a limerick I came across a while ago. There was a young lady of Kent who said that she knew what men meant when they asked her to dine on oysters and wine. Yes, she knew, oh, she knew, but she went. We know Jesus has won the victory and the devil is defeated. Yet, the devil is still active and we still get tempted and we still sin. And we need to know right now and experience right now the continuing liberating power of Jesus in our life over sin. And the writer says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. The fourth reason Jesus shared our humanity is to help us in our temptation. And we can turn to Jesus in our temptations, our trials, our sufferings, because he knows and understands what it's like to be tempted, because he has been through temptation and worse before us. And therefore he can instruct us, guide us, and sympathetically understand us. And more than that, by his spirit in our lives, he can strengthen us with his power so that we might overcome temptation. 
And he is the faithful high priest interceding for us now. He is God with us, Emmanuel. He's the one who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took upon yourself humanity. You became one of us. And therefore you understand what it is to be human. We thank you, Lord, that you stand with us. Lord, that you pray for us right now. And you sent your spirit to be with us, to help us and strengthen us. Amen. Let us uh, sing. Uh, final song, He Has Risen. Jesus Christ, send us out with confidence in your word to tell the world of your saving acts and bring glory to your name. 